on the Illinois Frontier Grounds. Okay. Uh, so thank you very much for that introduction. Thank you to Dr. Zach, Dr. Fayetteau, Dr. Doss, who've been uh, so welcoming to the sort of odd duck law professor who hangs out with a bunch of scientists and makes me really happy every once in a while. So thank you for welcoming the, uh, uh, the lawyer to your married crew. I appreciate that. Um, so, so what I'm going to focus on here today is the paper that I've been working on that is concerned with um, the water crisis in the United States, in particular with respect to Texas and this region. Uh, and I'm basing this article on this idea about the Big Short. Have you seen that movie, Big Short? Read the book, Big Short. Uh, okay, so for those that haven't, we're going to go primer. We're going to take you way back to 2007, 2008. We're going to go over uh, some of the concepts about the first big short. That's what I'm calling it here today. So uh, this is the movie, right? It's an excellent film. No one's seen it, really. It's really wonderful. Uh, same thing with the book. If you've read it, you don't have time. The students are going to see the movie. Uh, um, so first, we'll start here, right? What is a mortgage, right? A lot of people have mortgages and they know what it is, right? Lawyers graduate from law school don't know what a mortgage is. So a mortgage, right? So so mortgages, how do we go from this happy uh, average American family uh, in this crisis to, to this? How did we get from happy people uh, in this nice family to uh, atomic bomb explosion? So let's we'll start with I'm trying not to trip myself on my Okay, uh, so a mortgage is really meant for two companies. One's a loan application, they like to go to the bank and loan application. Uh, that's a personal promise to pay, which you can sue for, which you do not pay it. But in the event that the, the, uh, the bank would like some other additional security that you will actually pay back the loan, they engage in what's called a mortgage agreement, which is really just a way of saying a security agreement. So they take ownership interest in the house, right? And they give you the money, so they that you don't pay. They can take the house back, and that covers them for their loss of the money that, that you probably lost. Um, so, so this is so that's what a mortgage is: two documents, a loan, and an agreement, and a security. Right? Okay. So now, as we know from the big short, mortgage-backed security is the big, bad, ugly thing that went wrong and it caused the financial crisis. It's a little bit more complex than that. So this is your basic mortgage-backed security. We've got all these homeowners, right? They're doing loans, okay? And then either a bank or some other firm will buy up these loans in the name by Bank of America or country loans. And they will package them into what's called a mortgage backed security. Now, that is your average mortgage backed security. So each one pays about thousands and thousands and thousands of mortgages. Um, so that's not all of that. So a mortgage backed security, this is just another diagram of that same example. The mortgages are on the left there, and in the center, with the uh, the, the tower there, very famous scene with Ryan Gosling in the film. Who knows what I'm talking about? Uh, the the most the least risky loans, right? Folks that have 800 credit scores, uh, fixed rate loans, proof of income, and everything. Those are rated L, triple A, double A. Very, uh, very safe loans, almost assured to be paid off in full, paid in every, every month and so on and so on. So the return on those is really low because there's no risk. Now, as you go down further here to the B loans and the BB and the unrated loans, those are really risky. Those are what we call subprime mortgages, which we'll talk about in a minute. And then those fail, right? The payoff is much greater. Okay, so we've got more risk, the higher expected payoff. So, here's what a subprime mortgage is, just so kind of on the ground. This is the sort of, uh, the movie calls them ninja loans, this would be abbreviation. No income, no more low credit requirements, no down payment, which means there's no loan to value requirement. So what this means is that we have given a loan to somebody who may or may not have a job, right? Who may or may not have credit at all, or maybe very bad credit, with no assurance that they can build up a equity in the house so they can refinance, right? And the worst part about these subprime loans is the adjustable rate. So they give you an introductory rate, it's very low, 
right? Then after five years, it jumps up, as does your payment, rendering you unable to make those payments in the future, thereby triggering a foreclosure some three, four, or five years down the line. So, this is a graph that shows an example of subprime lending that expanded in the United States during this period of time, ending in 2007. You can see that in 04, 05, 06, subprime loan loans were all arranged, right? These were incentivized by mortgage brokers to give these people uh, under less than ideal conditions, and so uh, they were strongly, strongly promoted. All right, so what's so let's look at the subprime mortgage market. So this is where the crisis really started to happen, right? You can look at delinquencies on the left side of this chart and foreclosures. The delinquencies folks that are behind on their payments, they skyrocketed in 2007 and 9, which is when the adjustable rates would adjust up for those loans that originated in 2004. And you can see the foreclosures jumped up to 15% by 2009, the delinquencies over 25% in 2009. So that is crisis level. Territory, right? So, we get all the rest of the development plans. We realize now that we've made a huge mistake that we are creating now a cliff with the main inside. So, that was what happened. That's why the subprime mortgage market uh, fared so badly. Right? So, so, we can look at a lot of people to blame for this, right? It's countrywide who originated these loans, right? Is it their fault, right? Is it the Federal Reserve Bank's fault? For not overseeing every property and say, hey, we think you're engaging in predatory lending and you're focusing on people that you know or should know can't pay these loans back? Or is it Lehman Brothers' fault for packaging these into a mortgage backed security and then promoting them and selling them? Is it their fault? Everyone is not a yes. Uh, <laughs> is it the ratings agency's fault? This is, this is from an agency that is most fun. Roundly criticized, especially in the big short, for being asleep at the wheel. Because if you remember the chart that shows the tranches, the ratings, the triple A, B, these are the folks that made those ratings, right? So they're the ones that are supposed to say, okay, this is a bad loan that gets a B rating, this is a good loan that gets a triple A rating. But what we now know is that they weren't really doing the job at all. Uh, and so we certainly blame them, right? Should we blame the SEC for not looking at the blame? And what they're doing in their disclosures, right? Did they have a jurisdictional authority? Did they not use it? They did it. Or is it our fault for chasing wealth in a way that uh, is unsustainable, right? Is it our fault for living beyond our means and for wanting things that ultimately lead us to our own grave? Um, so, what on earth does this have to do with water or climate variability? We're talking about mortgages. How are we? How are we going to connect these two things up? Well, I think there are some important similarities here between these two events. One of which is the uh, magnitude of how awful the amount of the mortgage crisis was, and how concerned I am with the magnitude of damage that our water crisis may create for not only our region, our state, or our country, and then the world. Um, so, this is the Mark Twain quote that led the big short, which I think is uh, such a wonderful. Um, way of summarizing a lot of the problems here that are, I think, are applicable equally to the subprime mortgage crisis and also the problem confronting us with water. So, for the folks who can't see, it says, Hey, what you don't know that gets you in trouble is what you know for sure that just ain't so. Right? So, anybody that's read Nate Silver or The Black Swan by Nicholas uh, Taleb, right, this is about the extent to which we can predict how things are going to happen, right? To the extent that we have good information, that information will continue to be the same in the future, allowing us to make good predictions, things that are likely to come true. So, in my view, water really is like a housing market, right? There are an expectation by all the players involved that the either the house housing value will continue to increase, or that the availability of water will continue to increase. Right? Because here's the truth of it. Everything would have been fine and dandy in the housing market. Had housing prices just continued to go up, then people would have had the ability to adjust their mortgage rate and refinance their loans, and everything would have been hunky dory. Except that's all the bubble and then popped. Housing prices went down because they were artificially inflated and they shouldn't have been down in the first place. Okay, so there's this, there, all the stakeholders 
have this need and expectation that water will continue to be available despite what we're doing. We also, and I think most of the climate scientists here will probably attest to this, we have a population and policymakers that uh, are ignoring signs that it will not continue to increase exponentially, while we are providing them with good science and sound theory as to, hey guys, it's not going to get any better. We need to think about how to get ourselves out of this. The other thing is that we are implementing policies and practices that are uh, expecting this continued increase. So the policies and practices that we're doing now are encouraging this, and they're relying on this, right? So the other sort of, this is where, this is why I can put on my law professor hat, right? We're really disregarding a lot of the jurisdictional gaps that exist when we're talking about water, velocity, and quality. I previously mentioned the Federal Reserve Bank and the SEC. It's a big question as to whether or not one of those entities had the appropriate jurisdiction and the authority to go after country of water and go after labor groups, right? The folks that run those offices at that point in time said, no, 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 of course you didn't have the authority, of course. So one question is, uh, we have these jurisdictional gaps, whether they are uh, actual or uh, mythical, there are jurisdictional gaps. And the other thing that I have railed at in my research is that I think our current thinking about water improperly emphasizes the commodity aspect of water rather than the public good nature of water. So we treat it more like a financial asset than we really should be. And that clouds our thinking as to how we should manage this resource. Okay, so let's give you a little facts on Texas water usage. Uh, this is what makes me really nervous. Um, okay, so I'll read some of this chart for you. Folks in the back who can't see, anybody want to guess what the orange bar is and is the most water? It's irrigation. It's, it's irrigation. The next one is going to be municipal use, right? We can link to Antonio and Austin for that. But irrigation is the primary uh, user of water in this area, right? Um, Another chart here for you. So we differentiate hydrologically and also in the law between surface water and groundwater. <coughs> Excuse me. So approximately 60% of the water, fresh water used in Texas comes from groundwater. Okay? That's a high percentage. Um, uh, and, it's, and about 80% of that groundwater is used for agriculture. Okay? So a lot of the groundwater we're using is being used for agriculture. Municipal use of more surface water than irrigation. So we're focusing here in Texas on groundwater because that's where we get most of our freshwater from. And the freshwater use of uh, groundwater is primarily irrigation. Okay? All right, so I'm not just going to pick on irrigation and producers. It's not, that's not all my goal here. Uh, I'm going to pick on Austin and San Okay, so the other chart that, that leads me to use with some concern is the Texas population growth rate. 2010, we got 25 million people. By 2050 or 2060, it looks like that will nearly double. Uh, last time I checked, people need water, so we're getting a lot more water in 2060 than we have now. The question is, where are we going to get it from? So, here's some global facts from the UN on the low amount of water usage 97% of all fresh water comes from groundwater. The fresh water demand already outpaced. Uh, Popular not outpace supply by 15 to 20 percent. So, those are just some facts. The news about the world's population and where it's headed. We're headed to 11 million, 11 million. Uh, it'll take us a little while to get there. But there are water shortages and literal water crises uh, all throughout the world, right? There are water crises when people don't have access to fresh water in our own country, like Flint and Detroit, parts of Massachusetts. So, um, this is not just a problem that's overthinking. This is a problem that is in Texas, this is a problem that's in Michigan, this is a problem that's absolutely in California right now. <laughs> so, in other words, it's pretty simple. We don't have enough water. So a lot of the solutions that I hear about now, and these are solutions, this is not presented as like part of the part of the solution. This is presented as here's how we get ourselves out of this mess. Well, let's talk about brackish aquifer development, right? Let's talk about taking out a saltwater aquifer, treating that water, and then we can use it for fresh water. Right? We can use it for irrigation, domestic use, whatever we want. Right? Ocean reclamation. I used to teach in Florida that have too much water there that might cause the wrong kind of water. 
talk about reclaiming water from the ocean, which is massively, massively expensive and has other detrimental side effects. We'll also talk about the relation to both of those things, desalinization plants, and the number of desalinization plants that were built in Texas, more are coming. The last thing that happens a lot in Texas, it happens a lot everywhere, but it's much easier to occur in Texas, is market transfers. So that's one uh, small town in Texas that's maybe on the Omaha for sells water to the city of because we need water, right? So they can do that, and that's pursuant to contracts. So there's no, in Texas, no other impediment, legal or otherwise, to selling water that you pump out of the ground. You just do it, right? We'll talk about those property rules that, that, um, that, prove, that, that deal with that issue in a minute. But here, what my thinking is all these proposed solutions get us to this conclusion that we'll just make more water, right? They just say we'll just find more of it. We'll either make it, we'll pull out of the clouds, we'll do rain, we'll do cloud seeding. You know, whatever, we'll just make more water rather than thinking about sustainability, rather than thinking about are we using water in an intelligent way. So, here's also why making more water is important. And this is a slide that I pulled from a YouTube video that NASA put together regarding soil moisture. So, this is the hook with climate science. This is the hook with climate variability. The picture on the right. Uh, considers a circumstance for our Earth where the climate temperature raises, I believe it's two and a half degrees, two degrees. Okay? All the brown spots you see on the right is a decrease in soil moisture. So that's a big deal hydrologically, geologically, because if we're getting 80% of our water from an aquifer, or 60 percent of our aquifer, that's just going to further deplete the aquifer. Right? At the same time, we're continuing to pump and use water from municipalities and irrigation. Got climate variability that already reduces that availability of water, right? So, my proposal here is that the solution to make more water is not really a good one that doesn't actually solve the problem. So, let's talk about some of these jurisdictional challenges that I mentioned. All right, we've got three broad ideas here for why this is problematic and why this problem of water is simply. One, we've got states that have a very different role with respect to water than the feds. Then international agreements. I'm going to talk about all three of these things to sort of explain why we have this uh, problem of uh, patchwork of jurisdiction. So let's talk about jurisdiction challenges. One, Paris Agreement. This is a momentous and important event where uh, countries from around the world came together and signed this international agreement. Right? It's not a treaty. It's not a treaty, we don't want to call it a treaty because if it's a treaty, it requires the Senate's ratification, two thirds of the Senate. And given the current political composition of the Senate, I think that's unlikely that would happen. So, the Paris Agreement is a big deal, right? The US and China just agreed. We're going to agree. Why buy this, right? And so, let me tell you a little bit about how this Paris Agreement is going to work. You can compare it to Kyoto, the Kyoto Agreement that was passed on here a while ago. So, the ultimate goal here is to limit long term global warming increase to one and a half to two degrees Celsius. And the US has made this pledge to cut greenhouse gases by 26% by 2025. Okay, so that's what we're going to do. Here's the interesting part of this agreement there's no binding specific country by country agreement. Okay? There's nothing that says China, you got to do this, the US, you got to do this. There's none of that in here because that's completely, utterly, 100% not feasible. For, for political reasons. Um, so the agreement also doesn't have any enforcement provisions that makes these greenhouse gas emission reductions mandatory. So it's not like a court decree that if you don't comply with it, they can throw you in jail or garnish your wages. This is not what that agreement does. There's no enforcement. The international police are not going to come off and start turning off power plants in China and the US if we, if we don't abide by this, right? So, you might be saying, well, Alex, why did they sign this? This seems silly. Well, that's because we're going to, the expectation of the Paris Agreement is that the countries will use their own domestic laws to enforce these cuts in greenhouse gas emissions. Okay? Now, that is a very, so one question we have, I'll talk about in a minute, is whether or not the EPA even has the authority to do this, right? There are going to be a significant number of challenges, generally from the Western states, about the EPA's authority to do this. Uh, that's no we're no strangers to that. 
Now, I want to contrast this with Kyoto's surveillance account. What Kyoto did is it had enforcement provisions, it had mandatory enforcement provisions, and countries like the United States, Australia, and China, and Russia wouldn't get behind any of those, right? They wouldn't get behind those because they can't sell it politically to their constituents, right? It was a non starter for political, for political reasons in their own countries. And so the Paris Agreement takes this, this bottom up approach and says, okay, Here's, here's our goal. You countries figure out how to accomplish it, right? Do pursue it to your own domestic goals. And that has worked, right? We've seen some traction on that. We need 55 countries and 55% of the greenhouse gas emissions to do it. Everybody seems pretty optimistic that that's going to happen. So that's good. One problem with the Paris Agreement is it doesn't talk about water, right? Now, it impacts water in a very positive way because it will reduce the uh, likelihood of that apocalyptic soil moisture scenario that I showed you. But nonetheless, it doesn't talk about water specifically. The next thing I want to talk to you about from covered international agreements, I want to talk to you about the role of the state governments today and the conception of property and the role of that plays in water policy. Right? Okay, so we talk about property in water, right? You have to start talking about Fox. The lone law student in the back of the room, Mr. Sam Ballard, that's exactly what I'm talking about. Because the Fox represents case from the 1880s that says, look, these two guys are chasing this fox, okay? First guy to catch the fox, they have the property right to the fox. It's that simple. It doesn't matter when somebody started chasing the fox. It doesn't matter if he bought 15 hounds to chase the fox. It doesn't matter the labor and investment that he put into chasing the fox. The only thing that matters is whether you catch it. And that, my friends, is the rule of capture from groundwater in Texas. It doesn't matter. It matters if you pump it, if you capture it, Yours. We're, the, we're the, one of three states in the union that has that role with respect to ground. So that's one way to identify who has the property right who doesn't capture it. Another way is, well, you have to use it reasonably, right? All the law students in the crowd uh, rolling their eyes at this, right? Because it's like, well, what's the reasonable person standard? It's like, well, I don't know. What's a reasonable person to think about this? So another standard for conceptualizing property and water is. You have the right to water to use water reasonably. And that can mean all kinds of different stuff, right? So it's a very flexible state. The last thing is uh, applies to surface water generally here in Texas and also in the West. It's a first in time, first in time. This originates from the California gold rush in the 1840s, where you had someone go out to a rural area. And if they were able to put that water, for two beneficial use in some other area, they're able to build a ditch or transport it some way, then they have a proper right to do that because they've invested labor and investment in doing so. We want to protect that because we want to encourage people to use the water efficiently. So you can already see that these three things conceive of property and water very, very differently. And some states use one of these for groundwater, another for surface water, sometimes they use the same one for both. But it's all over the map. Okay. So why is that such a problem? Well, private property has these components in general, right? If you were, if I were to ask you what kind of property do you own, right, you would be able to give me a deed or a flat map or something that says, here are the four corners of my property that I own, here's the car that I own, right? The thing, the thing that's nice about those things is that they're permanent, right? They're predictable. We get price things adequately because we have enough information. And so that's generally the aspects of property we like. The problem with that is that in water, water is none of those things. Water is variable, it's difficult to price accurately, and the reliance and expectations and entitlements are significant to people that need that water. And so property is a very difficult concept to impose on water because it doesn't operate or function like any other resource that, uh, to which we apply this concept. So, we talked about the problems and property rules create for water use. What do states have to do with this? States are the water administrators for those communities, right? So, if you want to use water in Texas, and it's for the Brazos River, you go talk to the Texas Commission on Environmental Quality. You don't talk to the federal government, right? You go talk to the state. They are the ones that are in charge of it. And the federal government is in no position to say what Texas does with the Brazos River in terms of who they give the water to and how it's able to be used, okay? <laughs> now, 
The other thing that's interesting about this is we, uh, I'll show a slide in a minute where you have rivers and aquifers that transcend state lines, right? They don't really care where the political boundaries of states are. So then you would have a number of states having jurisdiction over a river, the Colorado River, the Oklahoma aquifer. That's problematic because you have all these property rules that conflict with each other. Okay. So the last thing I'll talk about here is this limited federal role that exists with respect to water. Okay. Now, the EPA is really the only agency that's tasked with dealing with the water directly. Right? They have a very limited role in what they do with it. Does anybody know what river that is? It's the Animus River after a huge mining spill in Colorado. It's literally bright orange. Um, so that's what they're in charge of. They're in charge of the Clean Water Act implementing that and making sure that people are uh, not discharging pollutants into a river inconsistent with federal regulations and law. But notice they don't have anything to do with who gets to use water or quantity or for what purpose. That's the state's role. So, like I said before, this is an example of the Colorado River Basin that spans seven states, and the Oklahoma Aquifer, our own Oklahoma Aquifer, that spans eight states. And so, I just want to point out that the law applicable to the Oklahoma Aquifer is different in eight states. It's the same aquifer, right? Same thing with the Colorado River. It's different in all of those states, right? But it's the same river. And so getting those eight states or those seven states to come to the table and say, here's how much water we think we should get, and here's what we're going to use it for. Anyone want to take a guess on how likely that is to go really well and smoothly? Yeah, it doesn't happen at all. It never happens. Um, usually Congress is called in to settle a fight, and nobody's ever had to go to Congress. So that's part of the problem. So, so let's talk about federal policy and water consumption. So I just I don't want to go on that Federal government doesn't do anything directly with respect to water. And that's absolutely true. What is, what is different, though, is federal policy with respect to agricultural, the agricultural industry. Okay? This is something that is uh, uh, critical to the economy and the social factor and market general. And it's changed drastically recently, perhaps. So in 2014, Congress passed a new farm bill which ended direct base subsidies to farmers that are engaged in certain commodity cross farming. What that means is that uh, direct pay previously would provide farmers with some revenue if the floor, if the price dropped below a certain floor for commodity crops, like cotton or oil or soybeans. So it would give farmers some assurance that they're not going to be bankrupted, right, if the price drops below a certain amount. Well, what Congress has realized is that that's really, really expensive, and we don't have the money to continue doing that. We don't have the money to continue the subsidized farming economic model that we have had in place for, 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 for three decades. So it ends in direct pay. Now, this graph on the right gives you a sense of the percentage of direct pay payments that make up the total amount of farm, of farm aid, right? Farm bill uh, appropriations. And the red is all of the commodity uh, direct payments, right? You can see that that's decreasing over time. And so when this farm bill, they ended it completely and replaced it with what they call subsidized crop insurance programs. Now, there are critics that suggest that subsidized crop insurance is just a different form of direct pay and accomplishes the same goal of providing farmers with revenue uh, when a price drops below a certain amount, right? Okay. So this is all part of the transition away from the subsidized farming economy to a more market-based farming economy. But the guarantee of revenue still remains, right? If you think about this from the producer's <clears throat> point of view, right, you have to make some judgments as to what you're going to plan well in advance of what you know the price is going to be. You can make some predictions based on past performance, but you don't want to bankrupt yourself by planting a uh, crop that's not going to get you the kind of return that you want. So this is the this is the policy of the New Deal era legislation to make sure that we have some food security and still have, you know, corn and soybean and everything. Right? Now, what does agricultural policy have to do with water? Well, remember that slide that says 80% of all groundwater is used for agriculture? Well, that's why, right? And so, my concern here 
is that when we're guaranteeing revenue, right, if a price drops below a certain floor, that may improperly incentivize some producers to farm for products that may not be desired in the market. And that way, we're using water for this process that we're then paying for through congressional subsidies. That's my concern is that this encourages an inefficient use of water going forward. Right? Okay. So I'll close with this. Um, this is a, it's a problem that keeps me up at night, right? I worry about this all the time. Uh, we have a lot of things we have to balance. We absolutely have to balance food security. Right? This is not about uh, complaining about farmers getting too much money. Also note that in the farm bill, something like 75% of the funds go to major farm and agribusiness rather than the mom and pop farmers that most of them are in the right? so, so there's a disparity with respect to who is actually receiving those subsidies and whether or not they're going to right? uh, So we have to be concerned about food security. Right? We have to be concerned about water security. That is the thing that is so terrifying. People remember the drought of 2012. That was a serious deal, right? Ask the people of Plainview what happens to the cargo plant when you have a drought, right? The town closes up. That's the, that those are real people in communities that are affected by this. That's because of water security. Right? So related to that, we have to be concerned about the extent to which we have private property rights that may be impaired or improperly trampled by some new policy, right? If you're gonna tell somebody you can't use your water for that, right, that's their private property. Nobody wants to be told how they're supposed to use their property. Of course, we have the overarching concern of climate variability that is interconnected with all of these things. And the last thing we have to be concerned about is the economic security, right? We don't want to incentivize behavior that results in an increase in water prices, also underlying communities to uh, make sound economic decisions that rely upon uh, that, that people in those communities want to exist. So the circumstance that I'm most concerned about is <clears throat> by stopping or delaying farm subsidy payments such that uh, cotton farmers in Lubbock or in our region stop producing cotton. What does that do to the cotton yield? What does that do to the rest of the town? Right? It all goes away real quick and hurt. And those are people that are losing their livelihoods and people that are losing their lives. Um, and we have to have some plan of thinking about this. And the plan simply cannot be, we'll find a whole problem. So my hope here is to produce some ideas that encourage sustainability and good judgment and an understanding of the reality that we're not just going to make a whole lot. We can't just do that. That's not the solution. Sustainable approaches to the world is what we're going to have to uh, carry today. And law and policy makers are going to have to get the scientists and the jobs how to sell this to the rest of the world. So that's all I got. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, I'm happy to hang out and chat or ask answer questions now. Uh, so, so thank you very much for listening.